Welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, my session today. Uh, I will be talking about web performance and specifically these new metrics that Google has defined called uh, Core Web Vitals. So without further ado, let's dive into this. Um, so as introduced, my name is Mashud and I lead the engineering team at a startup called Sustadike.pk. Uh, the startup is based here in Karachi and we're essentially an online travel agent for Pakistani travel. Uh, so if you want to buy tickets, uh, hotels, visa and stuff, you can you go online and check it out. Um, besides that, I, I'm an active community member. All these logos on the right are different um, communities that I'm working with. And I'm also a what's something called a Google developer expert. And I, I've also recently started my podcast. Uh, so if you want to learn more things about me or things I'd like to share about, you can, you can check that out as well. So coming to the main topic at hand today, um, core web vitals. Um, so core web vitals key essentially is what what was the reason core web vitals were created? So Google has been working on improving web uh, technology, improving the web experience for everyone for a long, long time. This is not something new. And uh, part of the journey was so nowadays, if you talk about measuring performance, you're measuring user experience. Essentially, you won't actually find any metrics online. You will find some metrics online, but you won't find a standard on, out, out there that just defines that if you can measure these three things, you can tell us about the website ka user experience overall. Kis ka hai. Right? So most of the people, they go on different websites, they measure uh, these performance scores, they measure these uh, uh, scores that help them understand the SEO performance website, but they're not really measuring the UX impact of the website, right? So Google has introduced these concepts essentially to completely uh, guide us essentially so that we can measure our website's metrics in a way that is specifically for the user. Or you may be metrics explain and it's going to be obvious why these are so user specific. So let's start with the first metric. There are three metrics in this uh, currently, and these are just an introduction to all the different things that are going to be done in the future, right? The Abisa Shuru Kiliona three metrics can, but down the road we will have new, more metrics as well. The first one is largest contentful paint. Our largest contentful paint uh, essentially, hey, yeah, we'll talk about this in a second, but first, this is the performance metric. Essentially, we're trying to measure the you website, kitney days load hori hai. And uh, in there, the most important thing that we want to look at is that counter on, on the right side. Okay, what are the, the limits that we need to take care of? So if your website is loading in two and a half seconds or less, that means your loading time is very good. If it's loading under four seconds, it's okay, but it needs improvement. And if it's over four seconds, it's not good and we have to bring it down. Okay, now, uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of us are developers over here, and we all know that our websites two and a half seconds may usually load, nahi hoti hai, right? So this is a hard target to beat, and this is something we'll be talking about more uh, in this presentation today. So, but one more important thing to point out here, and that is that uh, two point seconds to what, right? That is always the question. Uh, 2.5 seconds to the time of a first byte when the browser comes or when something comes to the browser or when the side loading is finished. Because even when you see something, the browser is loading, the test scripts background is loading. So what does loading mean over here? And this is the most important thing that Google has introduced is less. Largest contentful paint would is really mean what it says here. That when you have the viewport, the user's viewport, the biggest object will be rendered, that is the point till which we counted. So from the point the users pressed enter on the URL to that point, render that could be an image, that could be a block of text, it could be anything. But just see what text render over is coming to be a hair, get your main content at your website. So this is the point till which we consider loading to be completed, right? There are many other metrics, including DOM content loaded or time to first byte and all of them. But the point is that this is the core metric that measures the experience. Again, the focus is on experience for these metrics. The next one we want to talk about is first input delay. And first input delay is about interactivity. So, if we talk about loading and performance, a user comes to my website, a website is loaded, 
तो लोड करने के बाद यूजर क्या करता है राइट एंड द बेसिक आइडिया इज के लोड जैसे ही लोडिंग कंप्लीट होती है तो यूजर आपकी वेबसाइट के साथ इंटरेक्ट करेगा अच्छी तरह से और राइट सो सो नाउ वर टॉकिंग अबाउट फर्स्ट इनपुट डिले एंड फर्स्ट इनपुट डिले इज ऑल अबाउट इंटरेक्टिविटी सो व्हेन द यूजर कम्स ऑन योर वेबसाइट एंड ही एसेंशियली द लोडिंग्स कंप्लीटेड व्हाट इज द नेक्स्ट थिंग इज गोना डू ही इज गोना बी एसेंशियली interacting with your website what does interactivity look like he might press a button he might scroll he might fill a form contact form or whatever right now how does user experience come into this user experience is essentially all about that can he actually do that right so what normally happens and all of us have experienced this okay, we go on the website we start it loads and then it's loaded something and now i want to interact with them and start scrolling but it, nothing's going to scroll the site is stuck for a few seconds and then it's going to respond back to me and then it's going to start jerking around and nowadays i'm specifically looking at linkedin it it does that a lot for some reason so uh so first in particular we want to make sure that the site has been loaded but now it needs to remain responsive right and what is the the timeline we're looking at we again have some numbers over here uh so good if you're able to respond if the browser is able to respond within 100 milliseconds when i press the button and i get feedback of that within 100 milliseconds i start typing in an input field within 100 milliseconds the text comes up right so the browser is able to respond there's nothing running on the main thread that's blocking it from doing its work so if nothing is working if nothing is working on the thread then you'll get a good score it's going to be under 100 milliseconds if something is working on the thread it might be anything more than that and that needs improvement essentially the last one uh, is cumulative layout shift now this is the trickiest one of all and this is again something we have experienced from day to day as well uh, and that is when i'm using the website a website has loaded i'm interacting with it i'm scrolling down i'm reading my article and suddenly something else loads on top of the page and all my content moves downwards right and now if i'm reading an article i'm lost right i have no idea where that thing went up or down and i'm i'm looking for it again and maybe then another image loads and then it moves everything over again and that's so annoying right um something that happens to me on twitter all the time apparently so the, in order to show you how this works uh, there is a quick video as well um uh, this is from web.dev uh, hopefully it's going to load up quickly and essentially in this uh, quick video you can see that at these two buttons and the user doesn't want to do it he wants to click on no but as he clicked on no uh, uh it something popped up on the top and he clicked on the on the yes button right so this is obviously not a good user experience and this is what we're trying to measure this score is calculated by how much the ui moves right agar if if it's a small button that's moved around or maybe it's a small text that's moved around then the score is going to be under 0.1 and we're good if it's anything more like you uh, put an ad on top of your content and the whole page moves downwards then you're going to see something as a 0.8 or 0.9 sco score which is obviously very bad so we've talked about these metrics and one of the things we want to focus on today is web performance so and we all web developers we understand that web performance particularly is very very hard uh it's not something that you know you can just go you can follow these five steps and it's done there's so many different angles to it and most of us spend actually time in code trying to optimize trying to use smaller libraries or trying to write optimized code in a way but there's so many other things that we need to take care of so today i'm going to run you through the complete journey that we go through that as a user a user goes through when they start opening a website and all the bottlenecks that come in between and how can we can fix on them or what can we do to avoid them essentially so that essentially we get the best performance in terms of the whole journey and then what are some of the other tweaks that we can do in order to improve our ux down the road so in order to do this we want to start with the user first and uh, so we've chosen a user he's a he's a green man that we've chosen for today and uh, the user is going to open up a browser and he's going to start typing in a url and this is the exact point where our journey starts as soon as he presses enter the first metric and that's the uh, largest content for paints gets starts to measure right so this is the most critical part that we we need to look into now what's the first action that happens what is the first action that the browser takes when you press enter most people would think that oh it goes to the server and fetches the content but that's not the case the first thing it's going to do it's going to check its cache now browser caching is uh, something that's not very uh, 
it's not something that it's super old, like it's been there from the start, but it's not something that's prioritized by the by the front end developers, right? So and partly because because this is not something that they configure. So this has to be configured on the headers of the response other that the server is configured on. So this is a disconnect that I've seen time and time again across different organizations. Okay, because a front end engineer can't really configure these cache policies, they think that it's not their job. But at the end of the day, the front end is what gets impacted by not configuring these. So it is technically their job to make sure that these are configured, even if they're not configuring them. Maybe it's your DevOps engineer who does this. So, but you have to make sure that they are configured and you have the right set of cache, right? You can't just say, okay, everything needs to be cached for a month because that's not going to be right. It's going to be different from your logo, which could be cached for three months or maybe a year to those assets that might be changing every day, right? So it depends on your website. The second thing I want to highlight over here is uh, service workers. Service workers are relatively new. They have come up with the last few years and they are super amazing when it comes to caching. As a syndicate, we're using service workers and what's the extension called the PWAs. And I can literally cache my whole website on the service workers so that next time when the user visits, there are zero requests going to the server, right? So that's something super cool and super fast, right? And the next time the user visits, it's going to open the website instantly. So that's super nice. Right, so for after the cache lookup is done, so in this case, maybe the, the website wasn't there. Um, it's what's going to happen is your browser is going to try connecting to the DNS server to essentially um, get the IP address of the closest server to you, right? So it's going to do what's called the DNS resolution. Um, now this again takes some time, so this is something that's not in our control, but something we have to keep in mind and we'll see how this impacts down the road as well. But this brings us to something that's very interesting, and that's called server latency. What is server latency? Well, uh, server latency is the time taken from your user's browser to the server and their journey back, right? So it's it's understood that when you content from any server, so I can't just uh, you know reach out and get it from the server. There is a cost associated in the travel time for my request to go to the server and come back. Now, how does this impact performance? This impacts performance because it depends on where your server is located. So if I'm in Pakistan, and if I'm in Pakistan and I'm trying to access a website that is the service in, in US, then my request has to go all the way to the US and then back. And that might take several hundred milliseconds, right? And that is each request, right? So our websites nowadays is not just one request. The first request is HTML, second is CSS, then there might be a few CSS files, then maybe a, a, a half a dozen JavaScript files. That time starts adding up. And again, we'll see how that adds up in a, in a bit as well. So server latency is super important. And again, as a front-end engineer, you might be thinking, but this is not my problem. This is a DevOps engineer's problem or some, somebody else in the company. But again, this is the front-end what gets impacted. So you have to be careful. You have to know where this your server is and maybe suggest that maybe, you know, moving the server closer to your users might be might be better. Next one up is using the HTTP2 protocol. Um, funny enough, uh, nowadays actually uh, Cloudflare, companies like Cloudflare are deploying HTTP3, uh, Cloudflare and Google. Uh, so HTTP3 is here, but my request is to actually at least start using HTTP2.0 because that's already a big upgrade from HTTP1.0. And why is that, right? So essentially HTTP2, when HTTP1 came out, uh, this was, for simple text websites with you know just one or two images and that was it that was the internet 30 years ago but nowadays internet is nothing like that we're having all of those video streams image streams uh, we have very high rich websites with uh, very big spas and whatnot right we could have a few hundred files being downloaded on, on a single website on on the client side so the whole purpose of HTTP2 is to essentially make it efficient to transfer multiple files to and from the server. It can send multiple date types of data. It can share headers and things like that. So that definitely improves performance when it's loading your website. The next one is server load management. And this is again something that for, for front-end developers, this, this might sound a little bit trivial because this is not something they would be directly managing, but this is something that they should be monitoring, right? And this is usually monitored by uh, this metric called time to first byte. So uh, essentially when I've sent a request to the server, the server will take it and 
put it in the queue. Now, if there is nobody else, then it's going to take it immediately from the queue. It's going to process it and return back the HTML file that we've asked for. But if there are hundreds or thousands of users on that same server and it's not balanced properly, then it's, that queue will be very long. So my request could be stuck in for a few seconds before the server takes and responds to it. So this is something again, as a front developer, I can quickly check is my server balanced fine so I can get the best performance and I don't have a bottleneck uh, essentially when it comes to rendering my front end. So we've talked about a few problems, a few different problems essentially, uh, some relating to uh, locations of the server, some relating to the server load, HTTP2, and effectively one way of solving all of these problems is to essentially use a content delivery network. Now, what is a content delivery network? A content delivery network essentially is a service that has servers all over the world, and it will automatically use the closest server to your user to ship your assets from. So it will take information from your server and will cache it on all of its all of its, all of the servers it has and it will serve it from the closest server to the user now this does two things obviously it's going to reduce the server latency because now the server is closer to the user but more importantly it will reduce the load from your server and then effectively that essentially uh, allows faster return times for for your website so it's better performance for your website right and then uh, Cloudflare is like CDN essentially all do a lot of other optimizations like image uh, size reduction and stuff like that, right? It's all built in, so it's a good package to use. So it's something definitely I recommend using everywhere. Now, this is the important slide, right? So we've talked about performance in terms of network issues. This, this is again not something that pertains to front end engineers, but something uh, front end engineers can definitely monitor. And this is a screenshot from the Chrome DevTools Networks Inspector. And here you can see effectively that um, there's a simple request, a very simple request that I wanted to do. And the browser essentially took a total of 44 milliseconds, that's right at the end there, uh, in processing that request. But what portion of that 44 second was in actually content downloading? And that's the surprising part. The content download just took 0.4 milliseconds, and one would imagine that that's the big chunk, right? It that that's what takes time, but that didn't take time. Uh, effectively, what took the longest time was actually time to first byte. So the server took some time to load, uh, to respond back. Uh, initial connection took a fair amount of time as well, right? The DNS lookup and uh, initial connection SSL stuff, right? So. We have to understand that each request has a cost associated to it. And by the way, on the top there's queuing, which means that uh, a browser nowadays does six requests at any one time. So if you if you have like 10 requests, so the first six requests will go in and when they resolve, then the next four requests will go in. So your request is gonna be queued on the client before it even goes to the server, right? So this is a very good way to see again how your performance is working in terms where can you save time and what is actually taking time and where do you want to optimize. Now, coming to the Angular world or more generally the SPA single page application world, what can we do in, to essentially improve the, the interaction, the experience over there? And so we have quite a few techniques that we've been using over the last few years to essentially reduce our bundle size to a very small and usable size. Um, gone are the days when our bundles used to be like two or three MBs. With these techniques, when we follow them, essentially you can bring it down to all the way, maybe 300 or 400 KBs. So the first thing I want to talk about is tree shaking. And tree shaking is all about essentially taking the code that you're using and shipping that. Now, this sounds like a sensible thing and something we should have been doing from the start, but it's a non-trivial problem to just take out the code and just ship that part only, right? Because there's so many files, they're interlinked, there's dependencies and whatnot, right? But now with the new bundlers, and this comes built into your React or Angular or Vue.js code now, and effectively you just have to make sure that you're using it the right way, right? So if you're not using it the right way, then your bundles, your complete bundles get imported and your bundle size will increase. So this is very important that only ship the code that you're actually using. and uh, we'll later talk about Lighthouse, and in Lighthouse, you can now actually see how much code that you're shipping is not actually being used. So that's also a very good indicator of what useless stuff you might be shipping to the client. The next one is code splitting. Again, nothing new, and this has been something part of the browsers for uh, some time now. It's a part of our builders for some time now. 
and code splitting is uh, super uh, useful because essentially it allows us to break our code into smaller chunks. And what that does is, and the way it works is essentially using something called a uh, lazy loading. So all of us who use lazy loading in our applications like Angular and React applications, they'll know that when they start using lazy loading, it will create a chunk for, let's say, the login page, then our main dashboard page, then for the user's uh, profile page, and only that chunk will get downloaded when essentially the user visits that website. And this is probably creating the biggest saving of all because now you don't have a single big bundle that's doing everything and you have those small chunks with a common bundle that has obviously the core libraries that that's required for the initial load. One of my favorite tools out there for uh, exploring is the uh, source map explorer and the source map explorer effectively tells you what's inside your bundle. So you just take this, you run it on your bundle and it's going to give you a very nice breakdown just like the screenshot over here. And this essentially gives you a visual view so you know immediately like, OK, this thing is taking too much size. So maybe I might use a smaller library over here. So one of the common ones that you'll see is moment.js. Moment.js is a very popular date library in JavaScript and uh, it's very, very large. It's like 400 KB or something, especially if you include the time zones in it. But nowadays we use something like date utils or something like that, DS utils, which essentially is uh, 10 KB or 12 KB, right? So that's a huge saving from uh, going from 200, 400 KBs to just 10 KB. So stuff like that is, is made visible when you run uh, tools like Source Map Explorer. And finally, I want to touch on something again that's on the server side, but it's very important, is something called GZIP. So effectively, we've all used zips and we transfer our files over zip because it's really good. It compresses the file and your server can do that for you as well when interacting with your client. So effectively, it will zip the file, your bundle, and will ship it down to the client and then the client will unzip it and use it. Now, if your bundles are slightly bigger, it's there is huge savings like you can see in the, in the screenshot over here. Um, but you have to keep in mind that there is overhead, so it has to unzip on the client side. So there is processing required and time for that. So it has, there has to be a balance. So if you're shipping many, many, many small files, then gzip might not be very useful. But if you're shipping a few big zip files for big JS files, then gzip might do wonders for you. Thing to note, uh, external resources are blocking. So essentially, if you're, uh, if you're not downloading them asynchronously, then you will get a render block. That means your content will not render while it's waiting for those resources. Um, same way we've talked about uh, um, first input delay where a user is not able to use, right? So what is actually happening? Why is the user not, why is your user, why is your browser stuck essentially? And that's because normally, now it's not all the time, but JavaScript is running in the background. So let's say you're fetching some files, maybe you're fe fe fetching some data, maybe you're doing some co complex computation. And if you're doing all of that, then your browser can't do any rendering because it's happening on the main thread. Now you have the option to move this onto something called the, uh, the worker uh, threads. Now we have on the browsers, so that then runs on a separate thread or uh, you can make sure that you don't run it immediately or you run it after some time or you make it concrete in some way. We also now have in terms of uh, script tags, this new tag in HTML called async, and this effectively defers loading later on. And I'm gonna specifically call out the marketing scripts over here that uh, are usually not optimized for uh, cases like this one. So you wanna make sure your marketing scripts are all asynchronous so that they're not blocking your HTML rendering because this is going to impact your largest contentful paint. Because remember, we're waiting for the largest paint to happen. That's the point to we count to. So if your browser is busy downloading a, a marketing script that's not going to be useful right away, then, well, uh, you're essentially going to be wasting time and losing points on that score. Uh, lazy load your content. So this is we talked about on Angular side, but we just don't. It's not just limited to Angular. You could have some uh, HTML templates or image templates that can be lazy loaded as well. This is something that's very common out there, and you have to ensure that you're using this on your um, on your website. 
Now, historically, we've been you doing this using uh, JavaScript libraries and stuff like that, but now it's available natively in your browser, so you can actually use the lazy tag on, let's say, your images, and it will essentially load them lazily. This is uh, obviously on Chrome, but uh, we're hoping to have this functionality on other browsers as well. Finally, I want to talk about CLS, and CLS is all about the content shift. So effectively, when if you have dynamic content, like let's say you have ads on top of your browser or images that are loading async, and this is a really good example. Uh, so here, this image needs to load in, but if I don't have essentially uh, the placeholder over here in the middle, then my content is going to be moved downwards, and that's going to give me a poor score. Right, so I want to make sure when I'm when I have images like this, I create those empty placeholders so that images can fill into those rather than my content being pushed down and that's going to reduce uh, reduce the experience like it's going to make the experience much worse for my users and essentially uh, cause issues essentially. So it's going to reduce my CLS score. Now we've covered a lot of things. Uh, where do you start from essentially? Uh, I've already mentioned this. So within your Chrome DevTools, you have the power called, uh, it's, a, it's a tool called Lighthouse. This is developed by Google and essentially managed by Google as well. And uh, this will give you an insane depth of information. So this is just the, a top level screenshot, but this is my, my website. I ran on that one and you get from all across all of the metrics that are available within Lighthouse and recommendations as well. And you can really grind into the data and see very to a very low level detail of what is being happening on, on your website, what's taking time and what's not taking time and where you want to optimize exactly. Uh, thing I want to talk about is web.dev. So uh, it's one of the best resources out there to, to learn from. And if you want to know more about Core Web Vitals, there are dedicated pages on this that go into a lot more depth that I have today. Uh, and essentially explain how do you do the, the calculations and improve your scores. And that was all it from my side. Uh, I hope you guys learned something today and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Mishu. It was nice having you.